why does this pump not create too much pressure and blow the radiator hose off? Well, because it's inefficient and is intended that way. Chrysler and all the other manufacturers that have water-cooled engines have this efficient, inefficient design. And it is called, it's called a centrifugal water pump. And I'll take it apart. So the water comes in from your lower radiator hose, goes in here, into the underside of the impeller. You can kind of see that there. So, water's underneath here. And the water pump starts to turn and it throws the water outward and in the process of doing that creates a higher pressure out here than down inside here which is what causes the water to move as it gets thrown out and around here comes out to the far ends here it goes all the way to the end of the block in the process there's holes in the block that go through the head coolant goes up through the head, comes out of the head into the intake manifold and to the thermostat. Well, when the thermostat's closed, this water is not going anywhere. And if it was a positive displacement pump where the water couldn't come back, it would blow your hoses off. But this is very inefficient and it's designed that way so that the water pump can continue turning, even if you're turning 7, 8,000 RPM, and not build so much pressure to blow the radiator hose off. So when the thermostat's closed, this thing can zing as fast as it wants, the water can escape here and go back down into here, as well as going through this hole and coming back up through the bottom and back up. So the water is just, just circulating around. It can sneak past when it's blown around here, a little hole it wants to go through them big holes much easier and causes the whole circulation to happen. The problem is you can't um, you can't do it with an impeller like this. Now some of them, Chevy's for an example, have a plate that goes across this impeller. And this helps a lot. With a plate across here, it grabs the water and is able to throw it out more easily and it has to come up over the top of that to come back down in here to just sit there and circulate. So you create a little better volume and that is something that you can do and to improve your flow. If you just took a teeny little plate and tack welded it on top of here, it would improve your flow. And there's enough room for that plate because as you can see, that impeller just barely sticks in to this cabin. So there's a bunch of gap between here and here. So putting that plate in there is, is a no biggie and will improve your flow and will make the pump more efficient. What I did and what I'm going to do today to show you how to do this is to take up as much of this gap as you possibly can so this impeller is right up against here. Well, you could pull this off far enough that it's right tight up against there and that would make it more efficient but it won't because as soon as you push this up against there now you've got a huge gap between this impeller and this housing efficiency hasn't changed it's either escaping through here or it's escaping through here what you do to increase the pressure and i will take this off actually I will do it to this one because it's already off, but I'll show you how to tighten this all up and make the water flow way more efficient. It's always going to be able to escape and sleep, sneak back around. You're never going to make it a positive pressure pump, which you don't want. If you had a positive pressure pump, you would blow the lines off here, blow the heater hoses off. This is just going to make a much better volume to where more water is traveling through the block instead of escaping past the impeller and going back down the bottom and just circulating around like it does when the thermostat's closed. So on my Barracuda, the one you've seen in all my videos, I had a guy weld in a chunk of aluminum in here, and then I took a die grinder and I trimmed it all off so that it flowed just kind of like it does here, but it took up most of this space. And then when I put the water pump on, 
Of course, the impeller was hitting that chunk of aluminum that got welded in here. And I had them take it on my lathe, and they just kept taking a few thousandths off and a few thousandths off until I could put the water pump on the impeller, and it was just barely scratching the aluminum. At that point, by the time you put a new gasket on, you have that much clearance between this impeller and this. And it works very well. I can go into a little more details on how mine is set up besides this modification, and I may do that at the end of the video. But for right now, I'm not a welder, and especially I'm not an aluminum welder. Buddy I had to do that lives in a different state. So we're gonna do the exact same thing I did before. I'm only gonna do it just a little bit different. And the material that I'm gonna to use to do this will cost you less than a hundred bucks. And it will stay in here, it will not come out if you do it the way I'm going to show you. It'll stay there for life as if it will put an aluminum plate in here and welded it. But it's a special two-part epoxy. And I'll leave a link to it in show notes below anything else that I'm showing you but so that you can purchase the right stuff because it's not just a two-part epoxy you throw in here it's a, it's a special epoxy it's epoxy that see it's a yellow in one container and a black in the other and when you mix it up it looks like well looks like military green it's ugly looking but this is how we're going to fill the space up in here and now I'm going to show you how to prep it and get it ready so that this stuff never comes out of here. A side note, this stuff is what professional porters use when they have to fix an imperfection or they ground too far in a spot on the intake side of a port. If it holds up to that kind of abuse, it'll hold up to this. They don't use it on the exhaust, it wouldn't hold, it would burn right up on the exhaust port. But intake ports, it's a commonly used material and uh, it will hold up wonderfully on this. Here we go in the process of cleaning it up. At least 40 thousandths because if you tighten the belts down on all this, it will flex slightly even with a good set of bearings. So my rule of thumb is 40 thousandths. It's 40 thousandths you'll be safe.
about 42,000.
like having a good smooth shiny surface like it looks like right now then you can go finer but it's not necessary and I won't be doing that I'll leave it nice and scarred up so here we are it's not going to leave an imprint but I can feel that it's high when I get closer and I start turning it you'll see this will be quite boring for you I'm sure I'll speed it up and make it go faster in fact I may just turn the camera off Still need 36. It's gonna take forever and a day to sand this with a 120. Yeah, it is. Okay. I'm gonna go get me some sandpaper. I'll be back. Alrighty, I'm back. Got me some 40 grit. this again. Actually, let's fold this up. You really didn't want to watch me sand for the next 20 minutes, did you? <laughs> I didn't think so. I uh, put the impeller or the pump on it several times, found out where the impeller was scratching the epoxy, sanded in that area, and continued to do that many times until there was no clearance. At the very end you'll hear the impeller slightly scrubbing or slightly scratching the epoxy. I continued to sand it until there was no uh, interference between the impeller and the epoxy. saving you from another 20 minutes of sanding. But don't worry, I'll slow the video back down and show you the end result.
right. 16 minutes later. Show. Sure. 